Okay, so here we are in the soliloquy that's going to conclude Act 2 of Hamlet. We are still in this very long scene, uh, scene 2, but I, as, I mean, we're, we're getting to the end, I promise. We would get there, okay? Uh, this is a scene, recall, that's taking place just after Hamlet had witnessed the first player give a couple speeches, one about Priam's fall and then one about Hecuba. And he goes into a, a soliloquy that really focuses on, uh, that's really self-reflective, I should say, really reflecting on his own self. And he starts by saying, what a rogue and a peasant slave am, and am I. This is a real soliloquy of self-loathing and self-hatred. He says to himself, look at this player. Look at all the passion, the force in his soul. Look at all the tears in his eyes, the distraction in his aspect. Look at the broken voice. Everything was all directed towards this emotion and all for nothing, for Hecuba. So this actor is able to produce these profound feelings and reactions for something that doesn't even matter to him, right? What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba? That he should weep for her. So he's saying, look, the, this guy is just playing a role and look at how deeply he's able to feel it. And then he compares that to himself. He says, what would that actor do if he had the motive and the cue for passion that I have? If he were the son of a father murdered who had revenge to take against his uncle, what would this player do? So you see that comparison that Hamlet's making between the player who is able to show all this um, for nothing, really, for something that never affected him, and yet Hamlet, who has lost his fa father, whose mother has been remarried to the murderer of his father, yet Hamlet feels that he can't do anything. So he says, look, the player, if he had my cause and motive, he would cleave the general ear with horrid speech. Basically, it's an expression to say he would tear apart the ear. He would kind of cut in half the ear of the, uh, the populace who heard this. Um, it would appall the free, make the mad guilty, confound the ignorant, amaze indeed. And yet I, look at that single line set there with just two syllables, yet I. And now we come down to uh, Hamlet reflecting on himself. He's like a John of Dreams, right? Someone just sort of, he's a rascal. The John of Dreams is someone who just dreams and thinks about things without doing them. He is unpregnant of my cause, meaning he's not ready to, uh, to give birth uh, about to um, his cause, right? He's not yet ready to sort of release it into the world. Um, he asks, am I a coward? He's saying, look at what I'm letting people do. Um, people are, are breaking my, uh, who are breaking my, um, what is this, my uh, crown across, um, they're plucking off my beard, blowing it in my face, tweaking me by the nose. Um, all these things are happening to him and I take it, right? Um, and yet I, I can't respond, right? I can't do it. And here he finally gets down to, oh, vengeance. What an ass am I. I am the son of a dear fathered murdered. I am prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell. And yet, like a whore, I unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab, a scullion, fie upon it about my brains. Okay, so look at what he said there to himself, right? This again, I started by saying this was a soliloquy about self-loathing, and we, uh, we see plenty of that here. Hamlet is just basically disgusted with himself that he has cause, he has reason to try to take action against King Claudius, but he is yet to really do anything. Remember, he's been playing mad for two months now. Um, somewhere along the way, he's probably had the thought that I should be doing something, and yet he does nothing. And now there's this thought, this hum at 519, and he says, uh, he now gives an indication of what he was thinking of with the murder of Gonzago that play he suggested to the players. And he says here, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play 
have by the very cunning of the scene been so struck to the soul that they proclaim their malefactions. Basically, they confess their guilt. Okay, so he has this idea here that if I can get a guilty person, namely the king, to watch a scene at this play that makes him think about his crimes, then he will just confess his guilt. I'll have the players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle, and I'll observe his looks. I'll watch him. And if he do blench, uh, meaning if he turns pale, if he blanches, I'll know my course, all right? Um, two things I'd like to emphasize there. First of all, with the, the indication, I'll observe his looks, we now see that the surveillance in this play is going both ways. We've already seen the ways in which uh, Gertrude and Claudius and Polonius are trying to use Rosencrantz and Guildenstern um, to spy on Hamlet. They're also, pre also going to pretend to ha hand, uh, hang out behind tapestries to spy on Hamlet. Now the surveillance is going both ways. Hamlet is being surveilled by the king, and now the king is being surveilled by Hamlet. But also, um, so that's one important thing. We also now know what he was planning on doing with the play in the first place, which is that he, he's going to insert some lines into this play, The Murder of Gonzago, that make the play more closely resemble his, um, his father's murder as the ghost told it. And now I, I want to focus on these last several lines here because we see something that Hamlet never admitted before. He says that the spirit that I have seen may be a devil, and the devil hath the power to assume a pleasing shape, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, the devil is very potent with some such spirits and abuses me to damn this. I'll have more grounds. Rel more, I'll have grounds more relative than this. Um, more in relative means more conclusive. So look at what he's saying. I've, I've started from the very beginning, suggesting to you folks that this play is really a play about epistemic certainty. And here Hamlet's saying that he has doubt. He doubts that the spirit he saw may have actually been his father, and he thinks it might have been some kind of devil. And the devil might be taking advantage of my weakness and my melancholy. So notice Hamlet there is admitting to us that he's feeling weakness and melancholy, and that he's worried that the, his own weakness and melancholy might have made him vulnerable to um, the devil's power. And so if he can watch the king, and if the king exhibits guilt at this play, then he's going to have more conclusive proof than merely like what he heard from a ghost, which after all is not great evidence, right? So, but the reason I bring this up here is because this is the first time Hamlet's given any sense of his epistemic doubts about the ghost and what it told him, right? Remember when, when the ghost told him these things, he said he was going to erase everything else from his brain and just pursue uh, his revenge. And now we're realizing that actually Hamlet's had his doubts. He wondered whether the, the ghost was being honest with him. He wondered whether it was really the spirit of his father. And so he concludes with this couplet, the play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. So notice what Hamlet's going to try to do with this play. This is really Hamlet's first aggressive act towards the king. It's been two months that he's been playing crazy. And his first aggressive act is not to wield a sword, it's to wield a dramatic art, a moment of performance in front of the king. That is Hamlet's first strike. And I think it's really illustrative of his character that his first strike ends up being a, an act of performance rather than an act of violence, right? His first strike is not going to be to sneak up on the king and, you know, kill him with a sword or anything like that. His first strike is this rather cleft, clever, excuse me, this rather clever and deft um, attempt to force the king to reveal his own guilt, all right? Very characteristically Hamlet um, as a as a means of trying to attack the king, right? This is not what a more physical um, and less cerebral her hero would have done. This is distinctively Hamlet. All right, so finally, as promised, we come to the end of Act 2, Scene 2. 
it was 536 lines, it was demanding, but now we are set up for Act 3, which is the act in which we're going to witness the play performed in front of the king. And that's our cue. Good morning. Happy Monday. Indeed, thank you. Happy Monday.